Hi, uh, I got a call about my son, Ben. Oh, yes, Mr. Mason. He's in with the principal. He'll be out in a minute. This is it. My first serious teachable moment. A chance for me to impart the wisdom of my life to my son. If he thinks he can get into Whatever he did at school and get away with it, no, sir. Not this dad. Look at him. Like a sponge. Ready to soak up all my life experiences. Maybe I'll tell him about the time we... No. No, he is not ready for that story yet. How did the TV dads do it? Like Mr. Tanner. Or Dunphy. Or the great Mr. Belding. Wait, he was the principal. Maybe he was a dad. Doesn't matter. This is going to be awesome. I'll start with a relatable story, then show how I thought I was cool by doing something wrong, and wrap it up by how bad it got and what I learned. Finally, bring it home with a scripture and a prayer. Dad, look at me now. I'm finally a father. And both Ben and I will remember this moment as the turning point in his life. And it begins in three, two. Mr. Mason. Mr. Mason, thanks for coming in. Ben is free to go now. You know, it was really great how he stood up for those other kids. He's not in trouble? <laughs> no, he's not in trouble. But my moment. You should be very proud of Ben. Great job, Dad. at Father's Day too, and it was all about honoring our dads. Not today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you know me at all, you know I am a huge exhorter, and I don't even know how to do anything but try to encourage people. I mean, you know, I'm trying to discipline children, and somehow it comes out encouraging, like, you can't drive for two weeks, but you're such a good driver. <laughs> or, um, I can't believe you broke that, but it's okay, we can replace it. You know, craziness, it's craziness. So I, this is going to come out, I hope, encouraging today. Um, I mean, I don't know how else to do it, so that's what it's going to be. But this year was fun, too, because Alan got to lead the worship. Didn't he do great? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so he said I was amazing, but I don't know that he said that last week. A couple of times, maybe I wasn't so amazing when I was stressing over this message. And No, I'm kidding. Y'all don't want to hear our personal business anyway, right? So we're in Flannel Graph Heroes. We're going to stay right there today. And um, several months ago, I was reading a novel by Francine Rivers. Anybody read any of her stuff? She's very good. She's a Christian um, novelist, and every time I read one of her books, I end up being challenged, even though it's, it's fiction, but she bases everything on the Word, so it's really cool. But I was reading something of hers. Actually, it was a series from the Lineage of Grace series, and one of those books in that series is on Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, I could talk about Mary today because she certainly was a hero of our faith, right? I mean, we could specifically talk about her faith and being favored and all those things all day, but I don't want to talk about her because what I was challenged as I was reading that book was about Joseph, not the dreamer, but Joseph, Mary's husband, the father of the earthly father of Jesus, our Savior. Um, 
I was really challenged by her word, and I think we have a, a screen, a thing about this, but um, Joseph is often overlooked, right? His role in Christianity is um, overshadowed, and I think primarily because there's no words recorded that were spoken by Joseph. But much like our video today, right, Joseph's actions, his life speaks louder than any words. So can we pray? Father God, you are so good today, and I'm so thankful to be up here. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you've given me some words to speak. God, I pray that today you will use me. Let me be your vessel. Let your words fall on open hearts. Lord, we just invite you into this place. We ask that you minister in a mighty and a powerful way and help us to leave here, Lord, encouraged, challenged, and forever changed. Lord, I love you today, and I just commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so what can we learn from Joseph? Um, we sometimes forget that God chose Joseph to raise Jesus as much as he chose Mary to raise Jesus. God hand-picked this couple to mold, shape, influence, and protect our Savior. Now, with all of that in mind, I think there's certainly something that we can learn from Joseph a father chosen by God for a holy son. Um, we're going to be going back and forth today from Luke and Matthew in order for us to get the whole picture of who Joseph was. But keep in mind, these scriptures are very familiar, so I need you to go with me as I pull out just certain parts of each of these scriptures so that we can look specifically at who Joseph was. And we're going to start today in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. All right, so let's talk about this. So Joseph and Mary were descendants of King David, and that's important because that fulfills the scripture about where the lineage of Jesus would come from. But hang with me because I want to... Um, give a little bit about how this engagement process worked, okay? So marriage was a three-step process, much like it is today, right? Today we date, we decide to get married, we have an engagement, whatever announcement, and then there's a marriage ceremony, right? Well, similarly, although very different, because we know that in Jesus' time, the marriages were arranged, right? Um, so the first step in their marriage process was that a man would choose a wife and there would be an agreement between the two families. This is called the contractual stage. Um, a dowry would be paid for the bride. A contract would actually be written up and signed. And then there would be this engagement party to celebrate this coming marriage. And at that engagement party, they would, they would announce to the whole community, all the families, the entire community would be invited, and they would announce that there would be a wedding, and a wedding date would be set. And then you had the second part. And the second part of this marriage was the engagement period. And during this time, there would be some courting. Now, we all know courting is a little different than dating, right? I kind of like courting. That's what I'd like for my kids to do. Um, but courting is the couple would have time where they would get to know each other. And so our story today actually is taking place during this time frame. So what was happening is the couple would come together and they would talk and they would get to know each other. Um, it was under strict supervision. And the, the husband would begin to prepare a place for his bride in his home. This is when he is starting to think future. You know, how, where am I going to put her? How am I going to protect her? How am I going to provide for her? Where is she going to be? All those things. He's preparing a place for her. And then finally, that final stage was the actual wedding. And the wedding celebrations typically lasted from five to seven days. Now, let me say this real fast, too. That engagement period was about nine to 12 months time frame. That sounds about right, right? It's about how long it takes us. But the third stage was the actual wedding. It lasted five to seven days. And then at the end of that wedding, the couple was officially married, okay? And they would leave and start their life as husband and wife. 
So my point here is that based on our scripture, the decision to marry Mary (laughs) had been made. It had been announced to the world, and it had been celebrated by, by family and friends. Everyone knew that these two were getting married. Now, Joseph has already started planning, right? He's already started preparing. He has spent time with Mary, and his heart is turned toward her. He's an emotionally attached to this young woman, and he truly loves her in this time. But then we get a little change in how things are going, right? So think about when you were married or when you were engaged. You have expectations of how this marriage is going to go, right? Um, I know I had lots of expectations. (laughs) Mistake number one. (laughs) He has exceeded my expectations far and above. (laughs) Life is good, honestly. But we're back to Joseph, okay? (laughs) Um, So let's go to Luke 1, 28 through 33. And let's read here. It says, Gabriel approached, appeared to her and said, sorry, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now notice, Joseph was not there, right? Joseph was not present when the angel appeared to Mary. So Mary had to relay this information to Joseph, yeah? Um, So I can imagine, and you can imagine too, but it maybe went something like this. So Joseph, I need to speak to you, right? This is Mary. She says, Joseph, I'm pregnant, but it's okay. Because an angel of the Lord appeared to me in the grove and told me I would conceive a child. He said that the Holy Spirit would overshadow me and I would become pregnant. And well, I don't know, but Joseph, I'm pregnant. Oh, And he said that he'll be very great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he'll reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. But Joseph, I'm pregnant. Now, what do you think Joseph heard? Joseph, I'm pregnant, right? In one swift moment with three words, you know that his world flipped upside down. His expectations, his thoughts, all that planning that was going into what was to happen later. And had these three words, Joseph, I'm pregnant, been spoken months and months later, that would have been joyous. But in this moment, was not so joyous. Now, can you imagine that? The betrayal that he must have felt. The range of emotions that he must have experienced in that moment. Now, no doubt some of you have experienced a similar moment of devastation. You're trucking along, and then boom, not so good. According to Jewish law, Joseph had every right to make a spectacle of Mary. He could have even had her executed for such a crime. But here is where we really begin to see who Joseph was. And isn't that true? that we see what people are made of in the midst of trials. So we're going to go to Matthew 1, 19. It says, Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man. Everybody say good man. And did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. The Bible says, Scripture tells us, that Joseph was a good man. So what makes a good man? Why? What about Joseph made him a good man? A good man. So I know some good men. You probably do too. Um, When I think about them, I think about the characteristics that make them good to me. Things like honesty, faithfulness, trustworthy, kind, and even generous. Those are all good characteristics. And I know some good men in this world that don't love Jesus, but 
possess some of those characteristics, right? So what then does Scripture say about Joseph and how he was a good man? Well, with all of his emotions that were swirling around and in the heartbreak, because y'all have to know this was heartbreaking, in the heartbreak of that moment, Joseph chose love, mercy, and protection over anger. Although he had set his mind on breaking the engagement, he decided to do it privately and quietly, not for a selfish reason, but so that Mary would not be dishonored or harmed. A good man will choose love. Now let's look at Matthew 1, 23, 25. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I love how God brings Joseph in here, how he invites him in to this special moment, this special time, this special thing that is happening. In verse 22, it says, All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. While this must have been a difficult thing for Joseph to understand, he chose to believe and trust in God. A good man trusts God. We also get a glimpse here into the trust that God placed on Joseph. Um, the message to Mary was that Jesus would be given the throne of David. But the message to Joseph was a little more difficult. It was a more difficult truth for him. And that was that his son would come to save the people from their sins, the suffering servant. In verse 24, we see that Joseph, when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. God chose both Mary and Joseph to parent Jesus. By choosing to take Mary as his wife, there would be some scandal that both Mary and Joseph would be attached to. So let's remember, they were in the engagement phase, right? It had been announced. Everybody knew they were engaged. And now suddenly, Mary is pregnant. Yet, and this will be on the screen, Joseph trusted God fully to meet his every need and in time would reveal the truth of his character when and where it mattered most. Thank God he did not make a rash decision based on emotion. But instead, he thought on these things, he prayed and sought counsel from the Lord, and God answered. I think we can learn from that. I think we can learn from Joseph because rash decisions based on emotions often lead to disaster. Now we know what happens next, and to be honest, I'd call down and I said, you're not going to believe it, but I found some flannel graphs on Amazon. And so I wanted this flannel graph board, right? I was going to set it right here. And then I was going to tell you the Christmas story, because we all know the Christmas story, because that's really what happens next, right? And I was going to put it on the flannel board, and I was going to walk it around. And I got to really looking, and he was like, sure, I'll order this for you, no problem. And then I got to looking, and they were four inches high. <laughs> I was like, nobody can see that. <laughs> so I didn't get them. But we do know what happens next. Um, Joseph travels with Mary to Bethlehem to reg register for a census. We know that while in Bethlehem, Mary delivers the baby Jesus in a stable. She wraps him in swaddling clothes or cloths and lays him in a manger. Then shepherds show up to worship Jesus while he is in the manger. And then finally, a little bit later, wise men show up to worship and bring gifts for the king. And that's where we're going to pick up next. So in Matthew 2, 13 through 15, and then 19 through 23. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up! Tell your neighbor, get up. 
Flee to Egypt with the child on his mother. And his mother, the angel said, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up! Everybody tell your neighbor. Get up! The angel said, take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who are trying to kill the child are dead. Verse 21. So Joseph got up, everybody say, got up. And returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he, he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned, warned in a dream, he left, everybody say, he left, for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said. He will be called a Nazarene. So three times we see Joseph being obedient. Three times we see Joseph protecting his family from evil. Three times in this portion of Scripture we see Joseph was a father that loved and obeyed the Lord. A good man is obedient to God. It's been said that the best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Joseph demonstrated unconditional love for Mary with undying devotion. He cared for Jesus like his own son and did what was necessary to keep him and his mother safe from danger. So in Luke, we find Joseph following the laws of Moses. So we're going to be at Luke 2, 21 through 24, and then 39 through 40. Verse 21. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Verse 39, when Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. Joseph followed all the religious customs according to the law of Moses. This was done to honor and obey God's commands. A good man is faithful and honors the entrusted role of fatherhood. It was customary that Jewish fathers would teach their sons a trade. Well, we know Joseph was a carpenter, right? We also know that Jesus was a carpenter by trade. So Joseph must have been devoted to his son. It was also customary for fathers to educate their children. Well, Jesus was educated. He knew the law well, actually. Of course, he knew it supernaturally, too. I mean, he was the word, right? Um, but we see in Scripture on several different occasions that Jesus, Jesus sitting in synagogue, listening, teaching, and reading the law. Joseph would have made sure that Jesus was educated. We read in John that Jesus was described as the son of Joseph, the carpenter. Jesus was well known to be Joseph's son. My point here, and this will be on the screen, is that by accepting the role as the earthly father to the Messiah, Joseph teaches us about the faithful obedience and the grace of God. When you accept your role as a father, you teach your children about obedience and about the grace of God. Now, Jesus' parents weren't perfect. I mean, how many of us have left our 12-year-old children for three days in a city by themselves? How many of us would like to on occasion? <laughs> I'm just kidding, Rachel. Um, there's no perfect parents on this earth, right? Although my sweet, precious Rachel, she sure thinks her dad is perfect. So I have to tell you all this story. This was so perfect to fit right here. 
But Rachel and I were driving home from school one day, and um, she was having a little difficulty with some friends, and I was giving her every piece of motherly advice I knew to give, right? Like, things like, Rachel, it's okay, you still have to be kind, and you still have to be, you know, uh, you got to let those things roll off your back, and um, I'm sure you've misunderstood, you know, all the things that a good mother would say. And, and she just kept on and kept on, no matter what I said was working for her. And finally I went, Rachel, listen to me. I said, people are just flawed. As I'm driving, I'm slapping the chair. People are just flawed, honey. That's what I said. They're just so flawed. They just, they're just flawed. And we just, we just have to love them anyway. And she goes, she kicked the, <laughs> the floorboard and she goes, well, dad's not flawed. <laughs> nearly swerved off the road. <laughs> no, I, it gets better. I, um, I kind of giggled a little bit, maybe swallowed some throw up. No. <laughs> but I proceeded to tell her that I was so glad that she didn't see flaws in her dad and that I hope that she always felt that way about him. Um, And then I went on to say, but first, got to understand that dad truly loves Jesus, right? And therefore, he's going to respond very differently in situations where there's conflict. And then I said, and secondly, your dad is very mature in the Lord. And so he's not easily offended, which clearly Rachel was easy to be offended. Um, And doesn't feel the need to prove himself to people all the time. And she goes, here's her response. Well, that's just not fair. And mom, you're really not that flawed. (laughs) Any other mamas feel me out there today? But we know that Mary and Joseph left Jesus, right, in the city. And I can imagine how Mary must have been beside herself with worry when they discovered that Jesus was missing. But honestly, if you read it, you'll see that so was Joseph. So let's look at that, Luke 2, 46 through 48. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And verse 48, his parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. This tells me that Joseph loved Jesus deeply and was just as concerned as Mary was about him. Now here was a man that raised a child that wasn't biologically his, demonstrated love to him and his mother by providing a home for them, protecting them from danger, and pouring himself into them. Now, I know there's fathers in this room today that chose that same path. I know there are fathers within the sound of my voice that made a choice they didn't have to make. Can I tell you that God is pleased with you today? There's much to learn from Joseph as a father, but for all of us, really. Joseph was as human as you and I, yet he found uncommon favor with the Lord to be hand-picked to carry out the task of raising the Savior must have felt like an awesome responsibility. Not awesome like in a cheer, but awesome in the truest sense of the word. These are the characteristics of a good man. Trust, obedience, faithfulness, and honor. So here's the deal. This will be on the screen. God has given each of us an awesome responsibility in the kingdom. He has handpicked each of us for a specific task. We just need to look around to find it. Today, we celebrate fathers. You may feel like you can't relate to Joseph, maybe because we don't see that he made mistakes. But you know what? We can all relate to Joseph. And fathers, you can today too. 
Because like Joseph, you've been hand-picked to raise your own little ones in the admonition of the Lord. You were chosen to lead your family, to protect your family, and to provide for your family. You, fathers, were chosen to educate and prepare your children for this world, and you were chosen to guide your children to their destiny. Like Joseph, good fathers are often overshadowed by their children and sometimes their wives. But like Joseph, when you walk out your calling as a father, you too become a testimony of trust, obedience, faithfulness, and honor. Now, parenting is the most difficult task in the world. For some, it doesn't seem to have turned out so well. But listen to me. We can only do what God has called us to do. But here's the deal. In order to know what God has called us to, we must listen to Him. We must know His Word, and we must trust Him with our children. So I want to tell you another little story. Right after Ashley was born, and I know this is coming from a mother's perspective, but dads, I know how you feel about your children, right? But when Ashley was born, it was very soon after that, um, she was my world, right? So you have this tiny little thing in your arms every day, and, and you're giving all the care that you can. But the love that you have for that little being is so strong and so intense that sometimes we're overwhelmed, by that love. And I remember every single day, honest to goodness, I didn't want anybody to touch her. I didn't want anyone to hold her. I didn't want anyone to have a relationship with her like I had with this this tiny infant because she was so precious to me. And I remember in the middle of the night one night, because, you know, moms get up in the middle of the night to feed their kids. I remember in the middle of the night just praying and weeping over this baby, over this infant begging God to spare her life all the days of her life, right? To spare her life, begging God to to be with her. And then I started giving him a list. God, this is what I I want for her. I want this, and I want that, and and I want her to grow up and be this, and I want her to, to become this and be a world changer and, you know, all these things that we want. And as I'm saying out loud all these things that I want... For this precious little infant, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. You need to remember, she's not yours, right? I've entrusted her in your care, but I created her. My plans for her far exceed any plan you may have. What I want for her is greater than anything you can imagine, but you have a choice. You can choose to stand in my way, right? You can choose to do this parent thing your way, or you can step aside and you can let me bring her up. And in that moment, as hard as it was, as an infant, a tiny baby, this baby that that I was connected to in such a a strong way I just had to go she's yours God help me Lord help me to not stand in your way help me not to want what I want but to want what you want for her life sometimes moms and dads we like to get in God's way sometimes we like to fix things sometimes we like to take care of things when what God really wants is to take care of it himself. Now, I know there's some in here who have followed after God all all your life, and yet your children have still chosen the world. But can I say this today? You have to keep praying for them, not getting in God's way. You must keep praying that that seed that was planted in their lives will bear fruit. And you have to continue to have faith because God is faithful. 
So dads, today I say to you, be like Joseph. Trust, believe, obey, and honor God because he is faithful. Can we stand?